Hey, Bridge City, I'm Pastor Eric. So glad you joined us for this online worship experience. And in fact, if you're new here, if you click the new here link, fill out the online form, send it to us, we wanna send you a $5 coffee gift card on us. Just our way of saying thank you for joining us. So glad that you did. Also, upcoming things happening right here at Bridge City Church. We have our girls' night on May 13th, and this is gonna be a time for ladies sixth grade and up to get together, to fellowship, and oh, by the way, there's gonna be ice cream Sunday bars, so you're not gonna wanna miss out, but you wanna register so we make sure we prepare for you to make sure we have enough ice cream for you to go around. So you can register online for the Overflow Girls' Night, May 13th, and also May 18th, it's a Wednesday night, gonna be having a wor all-campus worship night. All four locations coming together to worship God together. Wednesday evening, our North Braddock campus, starting at 7.30, is, a, is our worship night. Coming up soon, make sure to plan, put it on your calendars, plan to be there for an awesome night of worship and prayer and time as we come together as one church. Hey church, as we transition to this time of worship, let's begin by praying. Father God, we just thank you for, God, for who you are. God, we thank you for what you've done. God, I pray as we, we worship you, God, that we understand worship's not a spectator thing, but it's something we engage in. It's something we do towards you, God, as we look up. God, with all the stuff going on around us, we look up and worship you this morning and at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, will not fail me now, you won't fail me now, in the way you think, the same God that's never late, is working all things out, you're working all things out, oh yes I you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name, oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all oh, my days, oh, yes, I will for all my days, oh, yes, I I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, will not fail me now, you won't fail me now in the way the same God is never late, is working all things out, you're working all
all I see Burning buildings, barren trees Hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc Son of man, I know you see The deepest depths unknown to me You have planted seeds among the ashes You rebuild, you restore all that's broken From the ruins You redeem all I stolen from your children. That's what you do. So be still, my anxious heart. All that's gone is never lost. Emmanuel is here, and he is faithful. I won't let my praises stop I sing it from these rubble rocks Cause I know you are good And you are able oh, You rebuild, you restore All that's broken From the ruins You redeem, you restore That's what you do, you turn sorrow to gladness, yeah, that's what you do, I give glory and honor for all that you do, I will sing hallelujah, for all that you do, you raise beauty from ashes, yeah, that's what you do. You turn sorrow to gladness Yeah, that's what you do God give glory and honor For all that you do I will sing hallelujah For all that you do Oh, yeah Oh, you rebuild, you restore Well, hey, church, we're going to move into our time of receiving our tithes and offerings. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. And I love that it's past tense. It's, it's saying that we've already received an inheritance. Often we think of inheritance as something in the distant future, or something has to happen down the road for us to receive it, but God's already given us an inheritance. He's given us spiritual blessings. He's given us divine privileges as we're in this series called Divine Privileges. And as we consider giving, realize we don't have to wait to receive something from God. We can give out of what He's already given us. We can give out of the rich inheritance that God has already given us. And to remember, we have a God of unlimited resources. 
And you know, I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of the church and the leadership. Thank you so much for your generous and faithful giving to Bridge City Church and knowing that you're making a big difference in people's lives. You're expanding the kingdom by generously and faithfully supporting what God is doing through our church. And I also want to thank you for consistently giving to the One Vision campaign knowing that we're still touching nations and still preparing and building a place for more people to come and hear the good news of Jesus. So as we get ready to hear today's message, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, God, that you are a God of unlimited resources. God, we thank you that we've already received an inheritance. And God, I thank you that we get to give out of that rich inheritance we've already received. God, we thank you for who you are. God, as we prepare for the message, may you open our hearts God, would you deposit the word into our hearts that we'd receive it and be moved to action because of it. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Hey, Bridge City family and friends. I'm Pastor Gary from the Brighton Heights campus. So glad you joined us today. We're continuing with our series called Divine Privilege. And so glad you joined us. Listen, this is the second week. We're walking through the ch chapter one of Ephesians. If you missed the first one, I really want to encourage you, go back and catch that so you can catch what we've been building on. You know, when I think of divine privilege, I think of the word privilege. And the word privilege has been pushed and pulled in these past couple years for its meaning here in our country, certainly. You know, sometimes privilege can be something very positive, and other times it could be something negative. But one thing we want to make clear here today is that divine privilege is real. There truly is a privilege to being a son or daughter in God. And we want to continue to investigate these things through these coming weeks. Ephesians chapter 1, the third verse, says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. I mean, catch that. that God, God is saying, God makes clear, Paul is making clear to us that God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. Not just one, not just two, it says, but every spiritual blessing. God has looked to empower us and bless us. And last week, we were looking at these divine privileges that we have, these blessings of God. And we covered uh, grace and peace is what we have. That is a divine privilege that you have. You have, you're holy and blameless. It's a divine privilege of God. We're adopted, sons and daughters in the house, and we're called to be part of his church. We're not in this alone. These are all promises that God has given us. He says, this is what I have given you. If you are going to follow me, if you're going to call me your, your leader and forgiver of your life, these are the things that you have. And you know, one thing that gets me as I, as I look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians is I'm, I'm always amazed. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm refreshed by the things that Paul reveals and emphasizes. You know, because in this series, four-week series, we're only covering 33 verses. But the 33 verses, it's so easy to take for granted what they say because they can even seem kind of, kind of repetitive. But, but listen, but listen when we, we hear about these privileges that God has given us, listen, those are meaningful. They, they should mean something to us. They should transform us. You know, you know if, if I think about a, a raw steak, you take a, a nice piece of steak, you know, salt can, can affect the steak, but fire transforms it, okay? Listen, the, these divine privileges, they should transform our lives. They should be doing something inside of us. And a question you have to ask yourself is, is could I be missing something in God in that these, these privileges that I have are not transforming me? Something more should be going on inside of me. I mean, Paul puts such emphasis upon who we are, like these riches that we have in God. 
And today we want to continue, we're going to continue to, to investigate what those are that we could walk in the fullness of the calling of God in our lives. Just join me in prayer. Father, we come before you. We thank you for what we have in Jesus Christ. And God, we ask you to reveal to us the richness, the transforming power of your grace that comes with understanding your heart and your promises. Father God, stir us inside. Don't let it just be something that, that affects me, but let this be something that truly can transform me and us. Amen? Amen. Listen, just, I want you to think about this, this for a moment. You know, we have an incredible inheritance in God. And, and let's just think about it in the natural. If, if you knew that uh, your rich uncle was going to pass and you were going to inherit $50 million, how would that change your life? Re reality is it would have a real effect. Suddenly, you would no longer be concerned about your financial future. You wouldn't be worried about your retirement. Yeah, you wouldn't even be worried about your children's retirement or your children's children's retirement. It would transform you. There would be, there, you would no longer be concerned with anything in the financial realm. You, know, you would know that you have absolute financial security. I mean, you are not just, you, you are not just having enough to get by. You literally are, are transformed by wealth. It would transform you. Now, the truth is, as a follower of Jesus Christ, there is an inheritance that we have in the future that is when we get to heaven. God has promised us eternal life. That is available for us. That's going to happen. But the other truth is, we've received an inheritance right now. We've received such, such riches in God that should absolutely transform us and, and move us forward. There's a, the inheritance we've received should be life-altering. It should absolutely transform who I am. It's an inheritance that positions me to live with security. It's an inheritance that puts me in a place where I am always expectant of good, no matter the circumstance that I'm in. He says, this is what I've given you. This is what's available to us already. You know, if someone did tell you, or I told you, hey, you're going to inherit $50 million. If, some, if, you, if I said that to you, I would hope that one of the first things you'd say would be, Show me the documentation. Show, show me. Prove to me that that's, that's, that that's, that's what's up because I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Well, and, and I, I agree. I would do the exact same thing. But the documentation is in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. We want to look at the Word. We just don't read the documentation. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we want to continue to study, really study Ephesians chapter 1, that we would see, look, it's true. It's true. You have this type of inheritance in Jesus Christ. It's, that is reality for you and I. Okay, so let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. We're going to read this text and then come back and, and tear it apart. Paul says in verse 7, he says, In Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ may be to the praise of his glory. This is what the word speaks to us. This is the reality that it speaks to us. And, and again, I appreciate Paul's focus. I mean, don't you just appreciate Paul, period? I mean, when I think about Paul, I think of how he has, man, how, how he is such an example of sacrifice, how he laid his life down, how he embraced his calling, even after he was told prophetically that, that God will show him how much he has to suffer for the good news. I mean, he, he embraced it. But you know, another thing that we need to, I appreciate about Paul, we need to understand, is that he didn't start out so well. I mean, Paul was a devout follower of God, of Yahweh. He was so devout, in fact, that at the beginning of his, of his ministry, he was out to destroy Christianity. 
Right? If you recall his history, he was out tracking down Christians. Paul had, was absolutely devoted, and he was trying to follow the word, but he was also absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. And, and I wonder at times, you know, Paul thought he had it figured out. But, but I wonder at times, how often do you and I think we have it all figured out, but really we're wrong? We're wrong. And I, and I can think of times in my life where, man, I was like, God, I got this. I got to figure it out. And then I found out my judgment was wrong. What I saw, what I thought wasn't accurate. And, and man, I, I mean, I, God had to, has to straighten us. But this is what I want you to catch out of this, is to be encouraged. If, if you feel that you've missed it in God, you feel like you've wasted years, you know, or you were chasing the wrong thing, look, be encouraged by the life of Paul. Be encouraged that here is a man who, who did miss it. He was sincere in his pursuit of God, and he was sincerely wrong. But the inheritance that he had in God, the, the divine privilege was still available to him, and it's still available to you. Don't stop. Don't let, don't let your past rule your future. God is still saying, you're mine. You have an inheritance. Let's, let's pull this apart as we look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. There's a lot in this verse. Let's unpack it. First, he says that it's all in Him. These things, this, 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 this uh, divine privilege all starts in Him. It starts in Jesus Christ. Everything comes from Him. And, and we don't, we're going to be unpacking this uh, in next week, but in verse 17, if you wanted to cheat and read ahead to verse 17, it, Paul's saying a prayer, and he says, he says his prayer is, I pray that, that God would show you in wisdom and revelation that you would grow in knowledge of Him. Not knowledge of how to reach the lost, not knowledge of how to save your marriage, not knowledge uh, of, of how to run your business or heal a relationship. He says, I pray you grow in knowledge of him. Everything revolves in him, revolves around him. The genesis of all we believe, the genesis of you having divine promises in your life all begins in him. So everything starts there. And he goes on to say here that we have redemption. We are redeemed. And redemption is such a powerful word, such a powerful word, because it, it really means, it literally means a buying back from, okay, a buying back, a winning back what was previously lost. I can think of various illustrations to catch this. I think of if you took something to a pawn shop, you'd sell it for less than its value, but you'd be able to go back and redeem it from the pawn shop. You could go back and, and buy it back. You know, that, that's, that'd be an example of redemption. Man, I, I gave it away. Man, I sold it cheap, but man, I was able to get it back. You know, and, because in the spirit, we, we sold out to the wrong thing. We sold out. I was chasing my own way, thinking I had, I had to run my life, and I wanted to run my life. But Jesus bought me back. Jesus redeem me. He paid a price. You know, in, in our house, we, we have an older home, and when we moved in, all the floors were covered with really nice rug, Berber carpeting. It was, it was nice. But what we didn't know was underneath that nice carpeting were, were beautiful oak hardwood floors. And somebody before us thought that in their, their plan, the carpeting was nice, but it was covering up these, these gorgeous floors. So we tore up all that rug, sanded the floors, varnished them. That We, we redeemed what was hidden. We redeemed what man, man had a good idea, but we redeemed what the original idea is. That's what Jesus did with you. He has redeemed you. You couldn't screw it up. I want you to know that. You could not screw it up. That anything that he couldn't buy back and fix. That's what redemption is for us. That is a divine privilege that you are bought back. And man, more on that cost in a moment. But it goes on to say that, that in him we're redeemed and forgiven. Forgiven. Forgiveness means complete pardon of sin. Completely pardoned. Justified. We like to say at Bridge City that when you're justified, it's just as if you never sinned. We are literally set free. It's like you know, if you stood before a judge knowing you were guilty, 
you were guilty and, and you're asking God, you're asking the judge for mercy. Judge, please just give me mercy. I know I'm wrong. And the judge looks at you strangely and says, there's no charges against you. And you're saying, I know there's charges against me. If you say, no, there's no charges against you. You're free. There are no charges. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. Someone has paid the price for you to be able to be set free. And, and what's interesting here in the, in the text also to note is that Paul differentiates between redemption and forgiveness. Because we, we tend to kind of lump those together, but, but he, we have this description in the Word of God that makes the, the, what God did for us, what Jesus did for us, so much more rich if we investigate it, if we look at the documentation that he has for us. Because, you know, think about it this way. Forgiveness like get you back to even. You know, when, you, when, when you're forgiven, it's okay, I, for, I forgave you. You're, you're, you're drawn even now. It's like your account was out of balance. You were overdrawn. Now you're even. Redemption is adding value. Like not only are you forgiven, God says, I've redeemed you. I've forgiven you and redeemed you. You are now restored. There, you have more value now than you ever had because of what we have in him. That forgiveness and that redemption is a divine privilege. These are privileges that we have. See, we have to remember, we are redeemed, not just rescued. Forgiveness is rescuing you. Redemption is adding value to you. By the grace of God, he fills us, gives us his spirit, right? fills us, lets us know that, we're, that we are filled with, with him. He literally comes and dwells inside of us and going forward. And it says also, again, this is where we want to talk about re redemption and forgiveness a little more, because that, that redemption, that cost was blood. And of course, it was the blood spilt when Jesus died in my place and died in your place. See, blood had to be spilled. I mean, is there, is there a higher cost for someone than someone spilling their blood, than someone laying down their life? Is, is there anything you can think of that, that would denote higher cost or higher value? You know, when I think about it, the cost that someone pays for something defines its value. You can say that house is not worth what they're asking, but if somebody pays that, it has that value. That's, that's reality. I know for myself, I've, I've had four wedding rings. Uh, one wife, four wedding rings. And I things kept happening to them. But when we got to the fourth one, my wife spent a lot of money on the fourth one. So I can assure you, I have not lost the fourth one. Now, you may notice I can't wear it. That's a, that's a story for another day, but it's not lost. She paid a lot. All of a sudden, I value, I value this thing a lot more. And when I think of the price that Jesus paid for you and for me, man, he paid with his life the value, the value he must see in me is so great. It should be the most precious thing in my life. And it should be the most precious in yours. How can it not be after what he has done? The, see, the divine privilege of forgiveness and redemption was brought to you at the, the highest of cost. It should transform us. It certainly proves God's love for us. Let's go forward here in verse 7. And eight, it also says, In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Riches of his grace. And when I think of the word riches, obviously I think of wealth. I mean, there's wealth. If someone has riches, that means they have a lot of it. There's a lot of riches, a lot of riches. But, he's, but then he says, riches of his grace. Grace is God's given power, God's given empowerment. It's unearned, it's unmerited. And, and it's great. God's given us this empowerment. So he's given us this, this riches of his grace. And it says he's lavished. He's lavished this upon us. He's lavished these riches of grace upon us. Lavished means lavished. It, it's extravagant. And, and he's given us these, these amazing riches. And so when we're thinking about these riches that we're uncovering here today, that, that's been lavished upon us. You, you, it's been lavished upon you. Forgiveness has been lavished upon you. You've been brought back even, forgiven. But not only that, he says, I redeem you. You're redeemed. You are, you are literally filled with value because God has lavished you with grace. He has poured grace upon you. Is that good news? 
Man, certainly, certainly it is. So today we live clean before God, forgiven. Today you're not just forgiven, you're redeemed. You have value before God. It goes on in verse 8 to say, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. You know, when I, when I think about you know, wisdom and insight in this context, it, it just speaks to me of God's amazing plan. Uh, I think all of us who, who have been serving God, it's, at one, one point or another, you're thinking, God, how do you come up with this plan of, of having your son having to come to earth and, and lay down his life for, for me and for us? I mean, couldn't you come up with a better plan than that? But we see that this was, this was done with all wisdom and insight. And, and when, when you contemplate that, and, and you remember that God is loving, but God is holy, and he is just. When, when, I, roll, when I look at those three things and rolling them together, man, there, what other way could he come up with to win us forgiveness and redemption? What other way could he make us holy and blameless and able to relate to him and literally have a way to heaven? other than giving up his son. You know, when, when I think of the, the wisdom of, of the wisdom and insight of, of this stunning sacrifice and the genius of its application, the genius that, that, that is applied that God says, nope, I got a way. I got a way that, I can, I, that proves I'm loving, that proves I'm holy and proves I'm just. It, it's amazing. And it's with all wisdom and insight that God did this for us. It's his plan. It's a plan that, that literally allows us to say, I am now a son. I am now a daughter of God himself. So thankful for those things. Verse 9 goes on to say, Paul goes on to say, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, there, those are a lot of words. We're going to simplify it, right? First, what, there's a mystery here. He wants to make known to us the mystery of his will. Listen, we've re been redeemed so God could reveal his plan to us. <coughs> Excuse me. The first part of the mystery is Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the, he's the answer. But really, what is the mystery? The mystery is found, I believe, in this verse itself, that God is bringing everything together. At the end of time, he's bringing it all together under Jesus Christ, that he's going he's to unite things all together inside of him. You know, under the Lordship of Jesus, he's setting apart for himself this church that's going to be redeemed as his bride. That's the message throughout Scripture. Okay, that's the mystery. He said, this is what he's going to do. Jesus, everything is about Jesus. Everything is in him, the divine privilege we have in him, and he is going to bring things together at the end of time. And I'll tell you, one thing that this speaks to me also is man just it makes me so thankful is is as i as i consider this is the, these things bring me assurance the mystery revealed that god's going to bring everything together at the end that that, is, that brings me assurance that means that all all the nations that seem chaotic all the immorality the wars the famine god's not worried about that he jesus isn't looking at the earth and saying it's out of control He's, he's not looking, he's not wringing his hand saying, what am I going to do next? Why not? Because he has a plan. And at the end of time, it's all going to come together. I don't see how that can happen. You can't see how that can happen. But he's saying, this, this, I've got this under control. The day is coming when every wrong will be righted. Everyone will be righted. And every matter will be resolved according to God's love, holiness, and justice. It's going to happen. So don't fret. Look, as you look around and see what's going on, no need to fret. He has this covered. He has a plan. Verse 11, Paul continues, in him, that's Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Here we have that phrase again. We have obtained an inheritance. We've got it. And we've been talking about the, how great the, the riches of his grace that in this inheritance, this divine privilege that we have. And, and we spoke last week as you know, we're sons and daughters, and as sons and daughters, we're 
predestined. We're predestined to have and inherit these divine promises. Those are available to us. Now, as far as, and this inheritance is according to his will, but as far as what this inheritance is, you're going to have to come back two weeks from now. Two weeks from now, we're going to continue this series next Sunday's Mother's Day. In two weeks, and you're going to hear more about what that inheritance really, really is. Okay, so as we, as we go beyond that, though, I think a real question we have to ask is, and you're probably asking is, am I living in divine privilege? Am I taking advantage of what God has given me? I mean, I have a privilege. Am I, am I using it? You know, how do I know if I'm living in privilege? Well, you know, I don't know a lot about trees. I don't know much about it. But, you know, but I know I have two pear trees in my yard. Why? Because pears, pears come off those trees. That's how I know. If they, if they didn't have pears, I wouldn't know they were fruit trees. It doesn't take great discernment. I just use my eyes and I, I see the fruit. Well, Jesus told us, he said, you can always tell a tree by its fruit, i.e. you can tell a life by its fruit. If you are walking in divine privilege, there is a type of fruit that should be in your life that people should be able to see. People shouldn't have to look at you and wonder, well, geez, I wonder, I wonder if they understand how good God is. No, there should just be fruit. That should just be happening in their lives. It should, these things should be bearing in, in their lives. You know, if, what's, what's the fruit that should be obvious for us that are walking in divine privilege? Well, let, let's think of a couple. Well, one would be just your kindness, your patience. It's, it's noticeable. How is it that, that, you keep, that you keep in this attitude? How is it that you're, you're, you're not one prone to, to, to depression and anger? How, how is that? How about the fruit of, being, of how you handle inconvenience? That, that you, can take in, you can see inconvenience and it doesn't rock your boat. That when you're inconven- inconvenienced, you still have joy. Your Saturday can be interrupted. You're still joyful. Someone needs help. Nope, I I can do it. I can jump in. I can change my schedule. See, there should be joy in our sacrifice when you understand your divine privilege and you're walking in. Sacrificing is a joy. Even financially, there should be joy. There should be joy. Oh, we get to give to the Ukraine. Man, okay, man, I want to be a part of that. You know, I don't have a lot, but there's joy in me. I want to be part of sacrificing. Why? Because I see what God has done for me. I'm understanding my divine privilege. I want to serve. Now, the the fruit that determines if you're really walking in uh, in divine privilege is that you're serving others. It's always about serving others. You know, a tree produces fruit not for itself, but for others, for us, for us. And the fruit in your life should be about, the good fruit in your life, Others should be able to partake of and see it. One other great aspect of, of fruit is that it just happens. You know, I, I've never walked by a fruit tree and, and see it grimacing, trying to bear fruit. No, it just happens. It's in the sun, it's in the rain, it, it's, it bears fruit. That's what happens. And that's what should be happening. That's what can be happening in your life if you're walking in divine privilege, if you understand the power of your divine privilege. And there's many things that can hold us back from divine privilege. Like what, man, what are the things that hold us back? We covered them a couple weeks ago in our last series. And that some of those things that can hold you back are grief and pain. You know, grief and pain can hold me back from the truth of who God really is. Right? Those, those things lie to me. Guilt and shame. Shame is an absolute monster that, that keeps me from seeing that, wait, wait, I'm holy and blameless. Jesus has paid a price. I can be forgiven. Right? But th- those lies, those lies keep us from walking in divine, divine uh, privilege. Unmet expectations. God has let me down. And again, not understanding. What has God already proven to you by, by dying for you and forgiving you and redeeming you. Can you really doubt that he's for you? See, so if, we, if we don't understand these things, these things can all hinder us from walking in the divine privilege that God has. We need to recognize these things. You know, when I, when I consider 
how do I, how, you know, God, what, how, why is it so hard for me to walk in this privilege and what do I have to do to fix it? What do I do to be able to continually walk and live in divine privilege? And one word that, that resonates in my mind is the word repeat. I've got to repeat, repeat, and repeat the reality. To, I speak to myself, the reality of who I am in Christ. Think about it. Why do you put your car keys in the same place every time you walk in the house? And some of you are saying, I don't put them in the same place. Hence, you got a problem, right? So you train yourself to put your car keys in the same place so you know where they are. That repetition, what does it do? What's it do? That order, that order in your life, this repetitive order brings security. It brings peace of mind. See, repetition brings peace. Right? Practice brings perfection, right? When I practice something. So again, so repetition brings peace. You put those keys there, I got, I'm got. i at peace. I know where my keys are. I know where my wallet is. I'm doing the same thing. We Christians lack repetitive discipline. We lack it. We, we don't remember who we are. And in context here, listen, listen. You will not walk in divine privilege if you are not repeating to yourself constantly who he is. In him you are found holy and blameless. In Him, you have grace and you have peace. In Him, you have forgiveness. In Him, you have redemption. If you don't continually feed yourself that reality, you forget. And, and what happens when we forget those truths? Well, we're inefficient. Life is chaotic. I'm inconsistent. I'm pushed around by the grief, the pain, and the guilt, and the shame. I've got to be one who sees the necessity of repeating to myself the divine privilege that I live in. Isn't it interesting that, that the things of Paul, the things that Paul is speaking here, the things that, that, that Paul is saying in his first chapter, and you will see that even in his prayer, again, if we, as we spoke of, Paul doesn't pray that they can do great exploits for God. He prays that they can know who God is. They pray that he, and he knows they already know it. He's saying the things they already understand. He's saying, you've got to really know it. You've got to understand who he is. Don't grow tired of hearing these things. You know, see, if you, see I, we got to be repetitive or else we can't break our default settings. You know, every one of us has a default setting. Uh, like your, your computer, your, your laptop has, has default settings. If you don't deliberately program it to do something different, it's going to do what it always did. You got to take effort. Well, you have a default setting. What's, what's your default setting on how you handle grief and pain? What's your default setting for guilt? See, you have to program yourself to look at those things a different way to walk in divine privilege. I want to close with 2 Peter chapter 1. And Peter was speaking these words uh, in, this, in this chapter. He's speaking these words we're going to read right after he was leading a list of divine privilege. He was leading, reading a list. And this is what he says in verse 12. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things. Even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth, you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. Paul, listen, Peter says, you know these things. I know you know these things. Man, you're doing them, but look, as long as I live, I'm going to keep telling you the same thing over and over and over again. God is good. You live in privilege. He has poured riches, lavished riches of grace upon you. But man, if you're not reminded, your default mode will take you right back, right back into living out of your flesh, so far below where he has called you to. He has more for us than that. Our divine privilege, as we finish this second week, we have grace in God. We have peace of mind in him. We're holy and blameless. We're adopted. We're redeemed. We're forgiven. And we have assurance. The way you're going to walk in that reality, the way you're going to walk in that reality and bear that fruit in your life is let's practice the power of repetition. Remind yourself daily. Read Ephesians chapter 1 and we'll know who he is. 
So we're gonna practice that power of repetitive thinking. We're gonna keep ourselves focused and remembering Ephesians chapter one. Now, before we close, we never wanna close without giving people an opportunity who don't understand divine privilege, who've never heard about this good news of God. And we would be remiss if we did not follow through and, and just give you that moment to consider what's it mean to be a follower of Jesus. See, you don't get divine privilege unless you become a son and daughter. And to become that son and daughter, there's a couple things you need to do, right? And first is to recognize, recognize, look, you need forgiven. You know, I've, I've been serving God a long time. I've never met anybody who said, I don't need forgiven. <laughs> Every human on the face of the planet knows they need forgiven. And we ask Jesus to forgive us. It's Jesus is the one. He's the one that paid the price. And, and what we, there's one other thing you have to do, and that is make him the leader. You have to declare, God, I'm going to follow you. It's no longer me who's going to lead life. It's you. I'm, I'm giving the keys to my kingdom to you. You're now in charge. You're running it. Whatever you say goes. There's a declaration that needs to be made of saying, I'm going to follow you. But listen, see, that's not that hard to do when you understand the privileges there are in being part of his family. See, God's not out to take from you. He is out to give you, give you what you've always longed for. Peace of mind, dealing with guilt, no shame, and a future with meaning and purpose. And if you've never investigated that, and you, and you, you even just want to learn, what does it mean? What's it mean to, to, to be a follower of Jesus, to be a son or daughter? We encourage you right now, look, look, hit, hit that button on the screen. All right, I want to know Jesus. Hit that button right now and one of our team members will, will uh, reach out to you because we want to help you walk in that divine privilege. Hey, we love you. Let's walk in this truth and enjoy the divine privilege that he's given us. Hey, if you made that decision to make Jesus the forgiver of your life and the leader into your future, you made an amazing decision, the best decision you could ever make. And in fact, we want to help follow up with you. So if you made that decision, you want to rededicate your life to Christ, click the I want to know Jesus button. Somebody from our response team will reach out to you to help you understand your vital next steps. Hey, we're so glad you joined us for this online worship experience. Have a great blessed week.